I'm Dan Rundy. I hold the Schreier Chair here at CSIS. Um, we're going to be having a, an on-the-record conversation about global media and foreign policy and public engagement. Um, my new friend, uh, John Lansing, is the CEO of the Broadcasting Board of Governors. I could not have done this uh, without the partnership and collaboration of my two colleagues on the stage. Uh, uh, Shannon Green, who runs our human rights program at CSIS, I'm very grateful for, for you being here. Thank you. And Jeff Manko is the Deputy Director of our Eurasia program. Thank you, Jeff, for being here as well. So. Happy Halloween, everybody. This is so. Uh, we'll the, try not to be frightful. Try, try not to be frightful or depressing. Actually, actually, I think um, I think John has got a very positive message. So this will be a treat. This will be one of your Halloween treats, actually. I think, as opposed to one of your a Halloween trick. So, um, John, I'm going to let you make a couple of minutes of remarks, and then I know you're going to show us a video. You got a tape. Play the go to the video tape, or they used to say. And then I think we've got some questions for you, our, my, my colleagues and I have some pan, uh, questions for you. And then we'll open it up, because uh, I know there's a very uh, knowledgeable and thoughtful audience here, and we're going to want to hear from all of them. I want to also recognize my new friend, Catherine Brown, who's a visiting fellow here, who oversaw the Commission on Public Diplomacy, is with us as well. So thanks for being here, Catherine. So OK, so over to you, John. Sure, thank you. Hello, everybody. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Happy Halloween. Happy Halloween. <laughs> So um, at a hearing before the House Foreign Affairs Committee in April of 2015, Chairman Ed Royce, uh, oh, by the way, the hearing was titled Confronting Russia's Weaponization of Information. Uh, Chairman Royce had this to say in his opening comments, quote, Russia has deployed an information army inside television, radio, and newspapers throughout Europe. Some doing the Kremlin's bidding are given explicit guidelines to obscure the truth by spreading conspiracies that the CIA is responsible for everything from 9-11 to the shooting down of MH17 God. over Ukraine. Others are simply paid more for demonizing the West, while those who pursue credible reporting are pushed aside, end quote. And I would say pushed aside is a kind term in terms of what can happen for pursuing the truth. It's bad for your health, if I understand it's it correctly. It's very bad for your health. Yeah. So through lies, intimidation, manipulation, barriers to internet access, or more subtle and sophisticated uses of half-truths and innuendo. Our, advers our adversaries are using information to create an alternative reality. It's their toolbox God. that not only supports authoritarian regimes, but also makes a mockery of the very existence of empirical, objective, and ver verifiable facts. Think of it as the age of the death of facts. In essence, they lie in an effort to make everything look like a lie. The ultimate form of propaganda is the absence of truth. The weaponization of information is being yielded this very day in, in our US elections, as you've all been following. One's left to wonder where the Russians or really any of our adversaries might stop and what we might do about it. And that brings us to the BBG, the Broadcasting Board of Governors. Now, you may or may not already know that BBG is made up of the five U.S. international media brands. That's Voice of America, Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, Radio Free Asia, the Middle East Broadcasting Networks, which inc include Radio Sawa and Al Hura TV, and the Office of Cuba Broadcasting, which has the Martis, Radio and TV Marti. The BBG is overseen by Today, an excellent board, four Democrats, four Republicans, and the Secretary of State as ex officio. The board members are presidentially appointed and Senate confirmed. The board is led by the chairman. His name is Jeff Schell. Jeff's day job, he's the chairman of NBC Universal Pictures, mm. and he's been really an excellent uh, chair. In fact, if he were here today, he would tell you that if you're watching a board meeting, uh, or attending board meetings and they're online, you really can't tell who the Democrats and Republicans are. It's a board that is really, for once, I, I might say, is really operating in a way that's helping advance the interests of U.S. international media. So our mission at the BBG is to inform, engage, and connect people with people across the world in support of freedom and democracy. Our work product mostly is professional, independent, underline independent, and objective journalism. But we also do other things. We do media and journalism training around the world. 
We do public service announcements for critical uh, emergencies, such as the Ebola outbreak, for example, in West Africa, to explain to citizens in West Africa what the United States is trying to do to help them so that they're not frightened or uninformed in a way that would hurt them. Um, we have been doing programming to teach English around the world for more than 50 years. It's one of the things that I learned upon coming into the agency. Really? And we have helped uh, everybody from presidents to paupers to learn how to speak English. And there's a direct correlation between English language speakers and civil society growth. Really? And importantly, we also support new technology investments to help keep the internet free and safe and open for people to use. There are many parts of the world where regimes have cut off access and punished those who try. And, and our Office of Internet Freedom invests upwards of $15 million a year to help get people on the internet. So through radio, television, and increasingly now online, social, and mobile platforms, we connect with over 250 million people in 61 languages around the world at least once a week. We target parts of the world where information is tightly controlled and, their free, and free press is either uh, under attack or non-existent. Broadly, we have two journalistic missions, and both involve truth-telling and are decidedly not propaganda. First, through Voice of America, we tell America's story to the world. And in doing that, we don't just tell the good stuff. We tell the good, the bad, and the ugly. But Voice of America's mission and role in the world is to explain America through its institutions and by way of objective and uh, independent journalism. This year, I had the pleasure of hiring the renowned, twice Pulitzer Prize winning investigative and business journalist Amanda Bennett as our new director of the Voice of America. And she's off to a really great start, injecting energy and purpose into the voice and working hard with her colleagues to aggressively stand up to the information weaponry, particularly wielded by the Russians. And you'll see more about that when we run our tape in just a second. The other form of objective journal journalism we do is through our federal grantees. That's Radio Free Asia, Middle East Broadcasting Networks, and Radio Free Europe. They are private, non-governmental, non-profit institutions that are funded through grants that we manage at the BBG. But their mission is different from VOA, where VOA tells the story of America and the world to foreign audiences. Our grantees fill the role as surrogate journalists where free press is uh, under fire. And so in places like Ukraine, for example, uh, Voice of America is uh, very well thought of in Ukraine for telling international and US news uh, objectively and fairly. Yeah. But Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty is in Ukraine doing local investigative journalism, investigating local corruption uh, among officials there because it's entirely unsafe for any local media to do that safely. Their work is investigated by nature and they hold governments accountable to their citizens where nobody else would really dare. They stand up for truth many times at great personal risk in the face of authoritarian regimes whose only interest in information is to control it and use it for power. So when I came into the agency a little over a year ago as, C as CEO, effectively the first CEO the agency had had, there was one individual who was in the role for a month and a half. Um, I spent the summer leading up to my start date in September uh, on a listening tour, listening to people like Shannon at the National Security Council and people in think tanks like this or at the State Department, the White House, listening to our board. And my question was, what does U.S. international media mean? What does it need to do to improve? What should our focus be? And those conversations really helped me boil down our, our first year in, uh, into five strategic priorities. The first priority that I heard loud and clear is that we needed to shift our, our uh, platform from radio and TV dramatically to more social and mobile digital platforms to reach younger audiences and future leaders. The second was that the five entities needed to work together and collaborate and be strategic with one another. And in years past, the five entities oftentimes were competitive with each other, were duplicative, sometimes even wasteful. 
And so I formed the International Coordinating Council, which brought the five leaders of the five entities together to meet with me twice a month to talk about how we can create a force multiplier by using two or more entities together to solve and go after uh, a bolder information and media journalism strategy. And you'll see an example of that in just a second. Third was to do more curation and acquiring content, particularly from outside sources that may be dissident voices unable to find a place for their voices to be heard. Uh, fourth, emphasizing impact over reach. You heard about our, ex our extraordinary reach in terms of audience, 250 million a week. But what does it mean to reach that audience? What happens as a result of reaching that audience? And so we've created an impact model so that we can measure the impact of our media around the world and hold ourselves accountable. And then fifth, to focus and make decisions and prioritize where are the most important places for us to be and where should we be investing? And it really boiled down to China, Iran, uh, violent extremism sort of writ large, uh, Middle East and elsewhere, Cuba, and Russia, particularly Russia. As noted earlier, House Foreign Affairs Chairman Ed Royce sounded the alarm related to Russians and their weaponization of information. And under our new strategic deployment of the ICC, we've created an answer in terms of that information uh, uh, aggressive, aggression. Through the Voice of America and Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, we have just recently launched the first, essentially the sixth BBG entity of a 24-7 Russian language cable network called Nastalya Shia Vremya. Roughly translated, that means current time. Present tense. Present tense. But it's actually a bit of a play on words, uh, I'm told, from my Russian expert, Jeff Trimble. Uh, in Russian, nesto yashia means now, as in right now, at this moment, but also means real, as in legitimate, the real deal. So the name simultaneously conveys the news is up to date and current, like right now, and that it's legitimate and credible. This Russian language 24-7 cable network was quietly launched in the first of this month, and there'll be a more uh, aggressive rollout at the first of the year as we shake out the the, uh, the learnings you acquire when you launch a network. It's a major part of our efforts to counter the revisionist propaganda. This new and growing network is a top priority of the U.S. international media effort. In fact, it's the top priority. It's an innovative, aggressive, multimedia effort aimed at Russians and Russian speakers in the former Soviet Union as well as Europe and around the world. It's growing very, very rapidly. So I'd like to give you just a, a, a little look at the uh, at the project current time through this videotape. Uh, it's about three minutes long, but it'll really explain what we're, what we're trying to do. So if you would please roll that tape, that would be great. Thank Vladimir you. Vladimirovich Putin. The Kremlin has a near monopoly on TV news for Russian-speaking viewers. It's used that dominance to expand influence abroad and tighten control at home. So how come NATO is now encircling Russia? The EU getting in bed with neo-Nazis. A de facto colony of the Western imperial forces. Now, Russian audiences have another choice. Current time, настоящее время. Вся неделя в одной программе. Продолжаем. Current Time is a professional 24-hour news network. It comes from Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, and The Voice of America. Barack Obama in his speech tried to identify for America the path that he thinks is important for the country. It's positioned to become the first choice for Russian speakers who want straight information, not the Kremlin line. The goal is to reach audiences directly via digital media, and smart TV apps, and on cable, satellite, and mobile platforms. In the target area, the potential audience of Russian speakers is more than 200 million adults. So, what does Nastoyashia Vremya mean? What can it do? Accurate, fact-based, unbiased news. Programs where viewers see what the Kremlin isn't showing. Worldwide reach from our bureaus across the Russian-speaking world, plus Western Europe and the United States. Live, immediate coverage of breaking news, events that cannot be controlled, spun, or buried. 
cultural and entertainment programs that show the values of a free and open society. The current Time brand is already achieving significant traction since its limited launch in 2014. This video of the Chechen leader humiliating a critic on national TV is nearing 2 million views. The current time videos, which are already being posted on social networks, have been viewed 100 million times. Russian media has a simple message. Don't trust the U.S. Don't trust the West. Our message is trust. Trust what's real. Well, that's it's really encouraging. Thanks, John. That was great. Um, let me so let me start with the question you get asked on the hill a lot, which is why are the Russians eating our lunch? <laughs> I do hear that a lot. Yeah. Well, part of that story is the investment. Uh, current, the the uh, BBG is roughly a seven hundred and fifty million dollar agency, and we're broadcasting in sixty one languages around the world. Our investment in Russian language media is roughly $50 million of that 750. So there's an imbalance. It's probably a half a billion dollar investment by the Russians in RT versus our $50 million investment. Are, are, do we have enough money to spend? Are we spending enough money on these issues? No, we're not spending enough money. on it. If we, if we seriously want to reform the BBG, and, and I believe we do need to reform the BBG, the first reform would be to invest more so that we can have greater impact in parts of the world where it matters the most. Now that said, it's also on the BBG to uh, shift our resources around to the most important problems. Uh, we can't be all things to all people. And so we've made a decision to prioritize Russian language media uh, so that we can get in the way of the narrative that the Russians are spinning about the U.S. Uh, and uh, this, this network is an example of that, and we'll be investing more and more into this Russian language. Network. Okay, I got one more question. I want to turn it over to my colleagues, which is, okay, so if a genie came out of a bottle and you got a wish uh, for what the next administration should do with the BBG, like what would your, what would your wish look like? And, you know. Uh, that my wish would be that the, uh, the incoming administration, whichever one it is, would see the critical value of U.S. international media and the lane that we're in in terms of objective professional journalism and how that demonstrates to the world, particularly parts of the world that don't have a free press, that while democracy can be messy, as we've seen in recently in our election, um, the ability to, to cover it objectively is a demonstration to the world of how civil societies work and how people can control their their own futures mm -hmm. when they have the information they need to do that. And I think uh, you can't drop bombs on every problem around the world. And I think uh, helping, helping keeping citizens free and open, open to the internet and able to access information is in the best interest of U.S. foreign policy. Just one last thing, just, just on that, like what would you like to see continued when you walk out the door of the things that you've been doing over the last year? Well, I think the cooperation of the five entities uh, has So you wouldn't really, split the, you wouldn't, I wouldn't split? It would be, a, it'd be a really a serious mistake to split the agency in half and then create two competitive entities trying to do the, the work we're together and collectively. You, you keep it together and have the five working together. Just, like, just like we just looked at with the uh, current time project. That wouldn't be possible without the cooperation of Radio Free Europe and Voice of America. To split those apart, you wouldn't have a 24-7 Russian a network the way we have today. So it's a demonstration of the value of, of working collectively as a, as a team. Thank you. Shannon. Yep, so John, you've mentioned, and the video mentioned as well, the importance of objective, real, impartial, and independent reporting. And so my question centers around that because I think when Voice of America and then the subsequent grantees were created, we were in an environment that was information poor in a lot of cases. So. We were trying to get information behind the Iron Curtain um, to people who didn't have any objective information. But in today's day and age where there is a saturation of information in the media landscape and where countries like Russia but also China and non-state actors are fundamentally kind of going after international values and norms and really trying to shape the narrative, should the objective still be to be impartial? Or should we be more sort of forceful and unabashed in promoting American 
values and norms and foreign policy goals. And so what are sort of the upsides and downsides of taking the impartial approach versus one that's a little bit more forward leaning in terms of saying this is who we are, this is what we're about, and this is our kind of spin on the news? It's a, it's a great question, Shannon. It's one we talk about a lot. Um, first, the, the Russians, for example, and the Chinese, but particularly the Kremlin, is creating a world in which the idea of an objective, verifiable fact no longer exists. Uh, by twisting everything into, into a, some form of a untruth, they are essentially saying that nothing is true. Now, the way to feed into that and make that even more successful would be for the United States to engage in propaganda, because that would, in fact, prove the point that the Russians are trying to, to create, which is you can't believe them and you can't believe this, you can't believe anything, so we'll tell you what you need to believe in. That said, uh, we are a taxpayer funded. We are part of the uh, a foreign policy uh, of the United States in our lane of objective and professional journalism. And I think by demonstrating through all of its messiness, as I said earlier, that we can cover the news truthfully and show both sides or all the sides, rarely does a story have only two sides, um, that we can demonstrate how civil society actually works and functions, messy as it may be, by truth telling. And that by itself upholds the very idea that there's such a thing as a verifiable fact. So I think that's our lane, that's what we stand for. Um, for instance, when the Iran nuclear deal was being debated on Capitol Hill, the Voice of America was up there and both sides were heard. It wasn't just the administration side. So we were doing objective, independent journalism, but in doing that, demonstrating to the world what that looks like and by its absence, what it might not look like in, in, in Russia. So I have another question, <laughs> if I can. Yeah, please. Um, and that is about the BBG surge capacity. Um, so I saw, for example, in 2012 when I was at the White House, how BBG could move into an environment like the Central African Republic where a civil war was beginning and use its platforms and its capabilities and its voice to get out messages of peace and calm. The radio station featured um, people from different religious backgrounds speaking about the need to work together and stay together. And I think that was a really good example of moving into an environment and delivering you know, messages and narratives that were very consistent with US values, but still very consistent with the objective of being independent. So I'm just sort of curious, as you have looked to strategically reorient BBG and the whole family of grantees, have you seen an ability to use some of the slack that's created, for example, to do more of this kind of surge yeah. effort? Absolutely. Uh, two examples come to mind immediately. One is in Ukraine and the other is in Haiti. Mm -hmm. uh, but after the invasion of Crimea, um, our, my colleague Jeff Trimble, who's here today, worked with the government in Kiev to bring flyaway FM transmitters along the region so that we could broadcast into Crimea and into, into the eastern Ukrainian uh, Donbass area. And then the recent uh, storm, just um, you know, this month, uh, that rolled across Haiti, my, my other colleague who's here, Andre Mendez, who's our uh, CTO, he, without even checking in, he just immediately put together a plan to bring flyaway transmitters down to Haiti so that we could broadcast you know, critical life-saving information in Haiti. So it's absolutely crucial and it kind of goes back to the point as well about cooperating, you know, being strategic and having the entities help one another. There, there's an occasion where uh, Radio Free Europe needed to get FM clearance into the uh, Kurdish region and uh, MBN uh, gave up uh, a radio transmitter for them to use cooperatively. So I, I really keep coming back to the point that we could always use more resources, but the credibility that we, that we need to have when we go to Capitol Hill or to the OMB for resources, we need to be able to say that we're operating at the highest level of efficiency now. And these, those kind of surge efforts give us an ability to, to have those stories. And as the next administration comes in and tries to wrap around its head around international broadcasting and what it means, would you like to see more space carved out for those kinds of surge efforts, um, or does it take away fundamentally from other things that you're trying to do? No, I think flexibility, just as, as in, I, I come out of the private sector, and I think flexibility to 
to move resources is really important, but I think you have to demonstrate that you have a strategy and a plan and that you've, you've been willing to make hard choices yeah. first, and then I think you have the credibility to ask for more. Yeah. Shannon, can I just, before we go back to Jeff, I, I know you, you have a, a major commission report coming out on violent extremism. Yes, we do. And we had a breakfast conversation, that issue came up, and um, I'm, sh I'm sure you've got, you, you must be thinking about how does this play into the combating violent extremism Conversation. You do, John, but I'm, I'm just curious, Shannon, how you how you're thinking about it and how it, it reflects on this conversation. Yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting because, as you mentioned, you know, Russia is eating our lunch um, in the international broadcasting and narrative space. The same could be said for some non-state actors. Um, so, what we've been looking at is how do we better kind of compete with their ideas and not just counter them or try to debunk them, but how to advance a narrative about what we're about um, that's more persuasive or more compelling to the target audience. I think the challenge is, and this might be a way of throwing the question back to you, is what is the role of government and sort of public entities in doing that? I think there's a lot of evidence that demonstrates that the more credible the actor is, the more grounded the actor is in the community that you're trying to reach, the more people will believe the message that they're trying to promote. Um, so I think it's been really tricky for the U.S. government. I mean, there are certain facts that we should establish, and we shouldn't let ISIS or any other extremist group kind of contest the environment without any pushback from us. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, while we're advancing those narratives, we need to be thinking about how to empower those credible voices to advance the narratives as well. So I'm, I know you guys have done some work in Iraq, for example, mm -hmm and getting some voices from communities to weigh in um, on how they see the environment. So I'd be curious sure. how you guys look at your role versus the role of mobilizing or empowering or lifting up the voices of people from communities. So in Iraq, um, we have a program through the Middle East Broadcasting Networks called Raise Your Voice. And it uses traditional media to drive people to digital and social mobile platforms. And with any good media strategy, whether you're in the private sector or the public sector, you always have to start with an audience target first and then plan backward from that audience target. And so our target is really young future leaders um, that can grow into people that have a different, uh, have a truthful narrative about what the world is really like. And so that's the reason we created this program. So Raise Your Voice starts as a TV documentary series that covers ISIS and their recruitment efforts and how damaging it is to families in Iraq. It's heart-wrenching uh, to see uh, the mother of a, of a slain uh, ISIS fighter who gets a phone call from ISIS about her martyred son and, and what it do, does to their family. And that, th that TV uh, series then converts to a radio call-in show and then the radio call-in show then converts to a managed Facebook conversation. So what's interesting about that, if you think about traditional media, traditional media is one transmitter to millions of people with one message. Uh, but as you get to a Facebook page, then all of a sudden the BBG is facilitating a conversation between individuals, young future leaders, about the issue of ISIS where they're informing one another. And anybody here with teenage kids, like we have, knows that these days, younger audiences that are consuming news, their most trusted resource for them is not a government or even a media network, it's a friend. Um, and so we want to be uh, enabling these friend-to-friend -friend conversations, but putting the, the facts as they truly are in front of them so that they can inform and raise each other up and not rely on a state actor or a non-state actor to be the voice of God. Jeff, thanks for being here. Sure. Um, I want to make a point and then maybe ask a question, you know, something that was prompted by watching the video. Um, you know, we have this discussion about the Russians eating our lunch. And if you watch the video, right, you have uh, RT correspondents in places like London who are speaking English to English-speaking audiences in the West. Um, not only in the United States, but also in places like Western Europe. And you, we've heard in your presentation, you're talking about how, with Natsaya Shevremia and other efforts, to reach Russian-speaking audiences inside Russia in the former Soviet Union. So my question, I guess, is leaving that piece aside, what do you do in these 
contested media environments in the places that RT itself is trying to reach? Uh, how do you push back against the, the you know, what a, a one scholar of this called the, the nothing is true and everything is possible narrative that RT is putting out in, in the United States, in Europe, um, and in other countries of concern that don't speak Russian? Mm -hmm. For Halloween this year, I'm going to be an RT correspondent, I think, of my, <laughs> my costume. You would look exactly the same. I'll look exactly the same. Right, 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 exactly. Doing it really well. Uh, no, Jeff, your point is, is well taken. The, the Russian language network, current time, will expand into Western Europe and other enclaves where Russian language speakers exist either as a primary or secondary language. But it's not our only effort, and Russia is not our only front, obviously, and we have uh, millions through our Middle East broadcasting networks in, in Arabic or throughout Latin America, um, China, all of Southeast Asia, but we're prioritizing. And I, I think as I look at our roadmap ahead, I, I can see a point in time where a 24-7 English channel uh, could be established based on the way we're reorganizing and working together now. And, and the other, you know, think of the global languages, Russian, English, uh, Spanish, Arabic, Chinese, Mandarin that I think we just need to have a, a strategy that, that maybe suggests that we have uh, the impact we need to have in the most critical parts of the world to U.S. foreign policy in the right language. Mm -hmm. Could you talk maybe a little bit about the scope for cooperation with allies on some of these efforts? I mean, I know some of our close partners in, in Europe who are on the front lines of, if you want to call it a Russian disinformation campaign, are thinking about this every day and, and see Russian-sponsored disinformation as being a top-order security challenge. So are there things that the BBG or the U.S. government more generally either is doing or can be doing to engage with those allies to, one, share the burden in a way that maybe maximizes the efficiency of the resources, but also where we can maybe trade best practices and learn from you know what works mm -hmm. in some of these frontline countries in Europe and what doesn't. Yeah, and let me just, this is just, this is more my ignorance than anything else, but I think if Spain has TVE, or the Italians have RAI, or the British have BBC, and the Germans have DW. So would they say, oh, no, 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 we're different than Voice of America, or we're different than, do they say, no, we, we have a similar mission? What, what do they say, because a little bit to, to Jeff's point, so, so in addition to Jeff's question, if you could just sure. elucidate on that. So uh, we're part of an organization called the DG7 that includes the seven uh, allied uh, information uh, agencies. I was in Bonn, Germany in June at the Global Media Forum and met with Dutch Avella there. Uh, we cooperate with them on everything from internet, not just Dutch Avella, but the BBC and Australia and Japan. We, we cooperate on everything from internet freedom. It's, it's Japan, Australia, Germany, who else? Uh, Canada. France. France. Us. UK. France, Brits, Dutch, Germans, Japanese, Canadian. Okay, yeah. so it's more than seven. seven. Okay, seven, okay. Yeah. So uh, we're cooperating with them on internet freedom. We're, we're meeting uh, in a month, to a full DG7 meeting, to talk about our impact model that we discussed at breakfast where we're measuring our success based on impact and not just reach. And, and we hope to be a leader in that and helping to uh, make that a, a sort of a global standard for measuring progress. Uh, Dutch Avella is on current time. We, we have programming from Dutch Avella mm -hmm. on the current time network as well. So it's a very cooperative uh, and strategic approach that we encourage, and and they and they uh, very much uh, agree with that approach. So I've got a couple more questions, and I want to I want to also hear from a variety of folks in our audience as well. And um, I'm also help uh, the. So just could you talk a little bit about how, what what is BBG's member? organizations doing in the Chinese language world? Okay. So uh, we have both, both the Voice of America and Radio Free Asia. Radio Free Asia acts as a surrogate doing local reporting, um, where Voice of America is telling America's story and doing international reporting. Um, in China and uh, Vietnam, Cambodia, Burma. Do you have correspondents in all those countries? We have uh, stringers and... Uh, Including people, in China? In, in China, stringers, yep. Uh, not very high profile, I, yeah. I would say. It, it's I would assume it's bad for one's health to be a stringer for... It's bad for one's health to be a stringer in many parts of the world that are particularly our surrogates. Um, 
I mean, our bureau, at Radio for Europe's uh, bureau in Baku was closed by the government, Azerbaijani government, and we had a correspondent who was doing investigative reporting who sat in jail there for uh, the better part of a year and a half, which just recently was released. Uh, it's the dangerous work that these people do, but we, we are throughout Southeast Asia and, uh, and, uh, the, and Indonesia as well. Talk about, I would like to, you to talk about what, what language, what do you do with the Farsi speaking world? How do you, how, 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 what is your footprint? What are you doing? Yeah, why don't you talk about that? Yeah. Here it is. It's working. Stand up. Say hello to our television audience. They can audience. see you on the live cast. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Here. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. Shannon, you yeah, had a I just wanted to ask a quick question about closing space because you mentioned the situation in Baku, but that's a situation. I mean, the bad that, guys are getting better at this. Yeah, they're getting a lot better at this. Right. Um, we talk a lot about closing space for civil society, meaning that governments are really clamping down and putting all kinds of restrictions on civil society. But the same can be true for the media and for journalists. Um, I think this past year, more journalists were killed oh. um, than in any you know previous year in the reporting period. So it is a difficult environment for journalists. So I'm just sort of curious about how BBG is handling that in terms of adapting to it, in terms of its own operations, but also being part of the effort to push back against that trend and try to preserve the space for media and media freedom. No, it's absolutely true. Uh, at Freedom House, we had breakfast, I think, with the Freedom House director. Uh, five straight years, press freedoms have declined around the world. It's becoming uh, a more unsafe world for journalists every day. We've, we lost a journalist uh, uh, in January in an airstrike uh, in Somalia. Um, we, um, but to answer your question, we're, we're amping up our investment in security, mm -hmm. both hard security at facilities and also personal security to the extent we can. But, um, and we talk a lot about it, we prioritize it, certainly. Um, but it, it really is a chance for me to just say how much we honor the dedication of our journalists in the field in places that are just more than unsafe. Uh, and the reason we're there by definition is because it's, it's not safe to, to be um, engaged in data collection and telling the truth. Uh, it's a sad part of our world and it's an important part of our mission. Can, can I just, let me just take advantage of this and then we'll open it up. But I, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you about Cuba. Mm -hmm. And so could you talk about what, you, what are you doing in Cuba and what kind of a footprint you have there and how, how much interest do you have? And people actually, do people listen to what you're, do are people watching your programming? Are people listening to your radio? Talk, talk about that. Yeah, no, we, uh, our, our work in Cuba includes uh, the Martis, radio and TV Marti, plus uh, martinotices.com. Um, our most, our best impact in Cuba is through radio. And we get feedback through uh, anecdotes from people uh, coming across and from uh, letters that get mailed that it's critical uh, because while there has been an opening, a diplomatic opening between the United States and Cuba, 
the state of the of free press in Cuba, as far as we understand it, has not materially changed. But in order to have data on that, we're, we're setting up a, a third party process now to see if we can identify any openings in, in media on Cuba, on the island, uh, so that we're operating from the freshest data available. Um, we're, we're, uh, we're noticing that more people are getting online in Cuba than prior, and mostly that's due to expansion at hotels and other areas where people can sit out in front of a hotel and get under the Wi-Fi. Wi mm -hmm. But um, so I, I, I want to be respectful of the diplomatic opening and make sure that we're as up to date as possible on press freedom on the island as we think about advancing our strategy in Cuba. But we're not we're certainly not pulling back uh, unless there's a material reason to feel that uh, people are having a better opportunity to to access a free press on the island. Yeah, I'd love to hear, uh, we have a visiting fellow who ran the, uh, the Public Diplomacy Commission. So I'd love to hear from, from Catherine Brown if you had a question. We have a microphone for you. I'd love to have you to ask. Hi everyone, I'm Catherine, and thanks again, John, for being here. I wanted to follow up on a question that Shannon posed about the issue of closing space and the opportunity, opportunities that BBG has in creating that space, um, either through journalism training or countering um, censorship or really promoting internet freedom. Can you talk more about these supplementary efforts that the BBG is doing in creating yeah, that space? Absolutely. I think well, fundamentally the, the best way we're, we're accomplishing that is through the expansion of our content on the social and mobile platforms where it becomes uh, possible for us to connect people with one another through our platforms and not necessarily create physical space and sort of one-to-many broadcasting. Um, but but the, uh, the area where we're investing the most in creating, I think, probably the most important space in order to do that is on internet access. Uh, in places like Russia and China and other parts of the world uh, where access to the internet is just not possible, or it's Iran, where it's tightly controlled, we have an office of internet freedom that uh, appropriators and the OMB have funded to the tune of about $15 million over the last few years. Uh, it operates through the Open Technology Fund at Radio Free Asia uh, and, the, uh, uh, and the BBG. And it's really helping us create and invest in tools that help people circumvent the censorship and to get online and to get online in a safe way because oftentimes getting online can be, can put your, your health at risk as well just by trying to attempt to access uh, online platforms. And so investing- In some places that's not welcome. That's, that's, <laughs> absolutely. So just it's, getting online is so a So it's crime. enabling people to get online and then once they get online having uh, something for them to, that satisfies the natural you know, urge to be well informed. Of course. Okay, let's open it up. I know there are a lot of thoughtful people in the audience. Okay, this woman here, this gentleman here, and this gentleman here, we'll do it three at a time. Name <coughs> and which organization is if you can keep your comment or question short. Yes. Yeah. Um, my name is Micheline Daniels, and uh, I'm here on behalf of uh, Applied um, Memetics uh, Company. We actually do some work with uh, the BBG. Uh, my question is, uh, given that uh, the, given that we are an open society, that basically we advertise everything we do, every program that we, you know, broadcast all over the world, we say, you know, this is American originated. And given that a lot of countries such as China, Russia, the Middle East, have spent a lot of resources on making us look really bad, what is the BBG doing in order to have the audience trust the source? What is the BBG doing to improve you as image um, abroad. Okay, just we'll just hold. Let's bucket three of these. This gentleman over here, and this gentleman over here. Like I said, extra credit for short. Thank you. My name is Ron Linden. I'm a veteran of Radio Free Europe. I landed there in 1989, and thought everything would be the same as it had been for some years. <laughs> Within three months, uh, communism had collapsed. People called me up and said, Ron, you are doing a great job. <laughs> and, and, and we did, and it, we, I'm very proud of my involvement and of what RFE did. In those days, the lines were a little bit more clearly drawn. Uh, and today, judging from what you said, Mr. Lansing, they are still, here's my question. Does it ever happen, do people ever come to the BBG and say, you know, we have other countries where press freedom is being severely restricted, countries which are allied to us, where an alternative message is hard to get through. The poster child of this would be Turkey, for example. 
do people ever come to the BBG and say, we should be involved in the media environment there, uh, even though they are an allied country? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. This gentleman here. Hi, I'm Simon. I'm a GW grad student. I'm also a journalist from Germany. And um, as you probably know, Germany is also under attack of Russian disinformation. And it is pretty um, vulnerable to it since um, Russia is using certain conflict lines in the German society <coughs> and is taking advantage of them. And they, they are doing that all over Europe. And they are at the same time reaching out to extreme right-wing groups at the one country and at extreme left-wing groups in the other country. So those people are open to the message of Russian disinformation because that is what they want to hear and that is supporting their understanding of the world. And since there are these, um, well, um, people in every country that want to hear that message, is there a way to reach out to especially those groups who feel kind of left behind of the society? Because I, th I, I think you mentioned before that you're also trying to reach out to the elites, but they will not be, um, those, these are not the typical groups Russian media is approaching with it. And the same ac accounts for all this money Russia spends on NGOs, civic societies within Europe to support its message. Okay. Sure. How do people trust you, uh, the RFE, RL, and allied countries, and what do we do about Yeah, well, I think starting with, with the point you made, which is a very good one, um, it, and I'll go back to our target audience and what we're really trying to do. I think uh, influencing people, I think, begins when they're younger and they're still forming their points of view. Um, I think we can't be broadcasting to, obviously, when you're broadcasting, it can go out to everybody. but in shifting to social and mobile and digital platforms, we're really saying we're shifting to a younger audience target um, in order to be influential in their world and to be not one to, to shove information down people's throats. Because you could argue that the, the tide of change is not on the Russian side, right? Mm -hmm. Because they, it only works for them if it's a single source media that goes from the, the, the Kremlin to everybody. Uh, but the world of media, whether it's private media or whether it's international media, U.S. international media, is shifting rapidly as the audience doesn't look to a single source anymore. They look to one another. And so if we can be the one that create that platform and create that trust, trusted uh, ability for, one, for people to inform one another based on our uh, values that we project, then I think that's our best opportunity for influencing people in the future. Um, I think messaging is the worst idea. I think anything perceived as propaganda, which we aren't doing any propaganda. So is just to be clear, you're, you guys are not in the propaganda. We business. do not do propaganda. Not only do we not do it, it wouldn't make sense to do it. It would feed the narrative that nothing's true. Um, and therefore, how would we expect to influence anybody if all we're doing is making that the narrative, that nothing is to be believed? I think we have to hold up the standard that, that there is such a thing as a verifiable, objective fact in the world. Um, and I think it's, if that's the side that we're on, and then if we're on the side of disintermediation in terms of media that's allowing people to communicate with one another and not a state-sponsored message, then I think we're on the right side of history. It may take a while, but I think we're on the right side. Yeah. In, ter too. in terms of uh, our former colleague from Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, uh, absolutely, yes, uh, we have conversations, and Turkey is a great example. In fact, we're, we're in conversations right now of, of potentially putting a bureau uh, in Turkey that might involve four of our five entities uh, working together, which we've never done before. Um, we, haven't, we haven't chosen to do that. We're just having those conversations, but it's a really good point and a point well taken. And then I'd say to, to uh, our friend from GW in Germany that back to the, the original answer, I, don't, I think our target is not the elites. You know, I, I, I think it's more of that age break than it is socioeconomic, and I, I take your point, and I know the Russians are having the impact that they're having, but again, I'll, I'll repeat it. I, I just think they're on the wrong side of history. If we continue to invest in digital media that gets to the audience the way they consume media uh, that, and get there first and get there effectively, then I think we have the best chance of having the right kind of influence for the future. Um, okay, I want to hear from uh, these, this gentleman here. <laughs> This woman here and this gentleman here. So, one, two, three. Okay. Chris, can you give it to this gentleman and then this woman here? Thank you. Hi. Hi. 
Well, my name is Çetu Özel. I'm from uh, Turkey, and I'm an independent researcher and uh, journalist. So as you know, Turkey actually uh, shut down about 20 televisions and newspapers recently. And uh, so what do you think about that, and how do you impact actually this? And also, the war in Middle East against ISIS. Kurds are fighting against ISIS, and they are the US allies there, and it's not only in Syria and Iraq, Kurds are living in Iran and Turkey as well. So the war is drawing many youth from other parts of uh, Kurdistan as well. So how do you impact this youth and people in Kurdistan against ISIS? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And this woman here. Thank you. Um, I'm Katie Wang with New Tang Dynasty Television. Well, also independent Chinese American TV network. Mm. Uh, my question is, uh, I heard that there are only two reporters of VOA working in mainland China right now. However, the Chinese government sent uh, hundreds of media people here every year. Uh, there was a congressional hearing focused on this issue, uh, asking, calling China uh, to give more reciprocal uh, treatment to the American media. So I'm wondering if there's any improvement on that. Do you see possibility of pushing back uh, on this side. Thank you. There was somebody else, uh, this gentleman here. Hi, uh, I'm Nick Benaquista from the Center for International Media Assistance. Um, as Shannon pointed out, there is a, an important debate going on uh, about how to respond to Russian misinformation or violent extremism and, and whether uh, and how and when counter strategic communications, counter messaging versus uh, the encouragement of plural media, how and when those different kinds of strategies work. Uh, the problem with this debate is that it's going on with very little evidence. Uh, the London School of Economics, uh, East Anglia, and us at the at SEMA have pointed out how w there's just not enough audience reception studies uh, in particular to determine which of these approaches is effective and when. So and this so, is like what advertising, I know that 50% of it works, I just don't know what the 50% is. Right, exactly. <laughs> so uh, my question is, you, you mentioned your, the impact initiative, the fourth priority that you mentioned, would that provide the kind of um, reliable and rigorous audience reception studies that's needed uh, to uh, provide some evidence um, and facts, speaking of a post-fact world, uh, to this debate going forward? Thanks. Yeah, just very briefly, I wanted to flag for you that we did a survey in eight different countries on perceptions of violent extremism. And one of the questions we asked was, what, what do, you do you think is more effective? A message that demonstrates what these extremist groups are doing, in other words, that demonstrates their brutality, versus a positive message that advances um, the benefits of peaceful coexistence, so on and so forth. And by and large, maybe three-fourths of the people said it was the positive messaging that made more of an impact. So again, that's just perceptions, but that is perceptions of 8,000 people in some really key countries around the world. Has that been released yet? Or? Yeah, yeah, it's on the CSIS.org website. Good. Okay. So, and I agree with that. Uh, but I would say, taking your point, that there are occasions where a direct counter-messaging is a, is a tactic in the overall information strategy, for instance, Radio Free or Radio Liberty, as part of the Current Time uh, project, has a, a unit called DIGM, D-I-G-M, that is a quick response unit. So when an outrageous fact comes out of the Kremlin that can be immediately countered and quickly done on like YouTube or on social media or on, uh, on uh, any number of digital media outlets, they do that. So I think it, it's, it's a punch, it's a counter punch that's still in the, in the toolkit. But I think overall, uh, I agree with what Shannon was saying, that ultimately I think it's about demonstrating that, that you're not just sort of out to de-verify facts coming out of adversarial governments, because I think it just, again, I think it speaks to the narrative that everybody's just, it's kind of like watching uh, politics on cable network, <laughs> as people are shouting at each other and nobody has anything to say that's constructive or helpful. The other two questions. Oh, and. Uh, uh, absolutely agree that we need uh, more media in China and take your point. Uh, how, how many, uh, is, it, is it a secret how many folks you have in China? I think that there are only two at present. Uh, 
to accredit it? Okay. So if you were to ask, if you had a wish of the Chinese government would be to have, get a lot more, right? So that's the, so for our friends in China, I hope you're hearing this, that we would like more than two, please. Um, thank you very much. Okay, and this gentleman here about Turkey. This yeah. question about Turkey. Any place that people are shutting down television stations and newspapers, uh, we think is a bad idea because we believe in a free and open press. Our mission statement is to inform, engage, and connect people in support of freedom and democracy. And we invest in opening the internet and keeping it free. And so it's just a value that is a United States value, but we think it's a, really it's a, it's a global value. It's, it's, a, it's a global right, I think, to have access to a free and open press. Okay, great. I know there's other questions. This gentleman here, anyone, uh, this gentleman here, other questions, other hands? Okay, we'll just do these two then. They're good. Name and organization. Uh, my name is John Brown. I compiled for my sins the uh, near daily public diplomacy press and blog review. Mm. Um, I've heard the word narrative mentioned at this talk and also mentioned twice in the uh, program. Also counter narrative. Um, <clears throat> it's become very much a fashionable wor word here in the, in the capital. My question is this. <clears throat> What is the difference between creating, or if you will, making up a narrative and telling the truth? Or in fact, is there a difference? Thank you. And this gentleman here, great question. Hi, my name is Guy Cheney. I'm an analyst with Media Partners. Um, measuring impact versus reach is a key priority for the BBG and many of its peers. Is the pivot to social and mobile part of that, or are there other tools that you're using to measure impact for your stakeholders? Thank you. Could you I, I, this issue of impact, I, you, 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 you've, you've shifted the way you're, you're measuring things, and I, I think this is really gets yeah, to that. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So let's start with that. Yes, sir. Um, the, the answer is yes. The shift to mobile and social digital platforms is because that's where the audience is that we're targeting. Um, but fundamentally, it allows us, I think, to find more examples of impact. It doesn't mean there's not, there aren't other examples of impact through traditional media, but through social platforms where you can measure the number of times content was shared or liked or created a, an online conversation of some sort. All of those uh, speak to the notion that you reached an audience, but what happened as a result? Um, we have, through our impact model, we, we developed something, something we call the 80-20 rule which means in 80% of the cases, we think we can measure impact consistently across all of our networks. But in 20% of the cases, uh, it would be more anecdotal and more difficult to measure impact. So that would be in places such as North Korea or the Uyghur region of China or Tibet, uh, Cuba. Uh, and so there, it's much more difficult, but we still seek to measure impact in those areas through anecdotes uh, that we can get uh, cross-border anecdotes, that type of thing. But fundamentally, we, we didn't want to not have a, a really uh, forceful sort of self-applied requirement to measure impact if we, but we knew we couldn't get in 100% of the cases and so we chose to find those cases where we could and then allow for the 20% to do whatever we can to fill in the rest. Um, narrative versus truth. So are they just both narratives? Is that the question? <laughs> What's the difference? So the difference is uh, somebody shot down MH17 over Ukraine. I mean, it's a it's a it's that's a, a fact. It's a fact. The it's plane was shot down. It's knowable, uh, and they can tell who shot down the plane. And so a narrative would say that the CIA CIA shot it down. A fact would say that those particular weapons of war were responsible for shooting that plane down. That's the point that I think is just important that we not give up on the idea of verifiable, objective facts that still exist. And it's the number one reason why we are not going to engage. There was a Russian military unit that was celebrating the fact they had shot something down and then they quickly realized they had shot the wrong thing down, right? Isn't that? Yes. Right? Those are. Yeah. Those are things that are out in the fed, right? That right. It was included. an investigation that, that was, found the that there was weapons. right. Isn't that yes? Yeah. The, the, the Dutch safety board just released the yeah. investigation a couple of weeks ago that established on a factual basis what happened. But of course, it was given a right. different narrative spin by RT and the Russian media. 
Right. But I think it's a mistake to say that narratives are always on the side of obscuring the truth. I mean, you can use narratives to tell a story about the facts. Yeah, yeah. True. I mean, it's a way, it's a storytelling mechanism. Um, but it stories can be are powerful. Right. Yeah, absolutely. That's what I'm saying. Making it, putting it in a way that's really compelling and resonates with the target audience, but can be comprised of facts. Yeah, that's, that's yeah right. I, I think one of the things is, and Jeff, I'd love to hear that. Um, you know, one thing is to have I, I, is is what I'm saying and what am I presenting? Is it something I could I could truthfully tell my mother at Thanksgiving? <laughs> you know, in terms of like some kind of minimal. There's some minimal, you know, ethical threshold of, am I telling some fib? Or am I exaggerating? Uh, you know, and I've always tried to be truthful with my mother and father. I'm not saying Absolutely. I wasn't perfect, but but I would just say that it generally it's a good <laughs> policy. Or do is is it uh, you know is, is so it just seems to me that um, in the case of this example, it seems to me there's been a whole series. You know, it, it's pretty hard to I, I, I have a very hard time imagining some central you know some centrally planned thing by you know it, it's it's a totally absurd the sorts of things that have been. That have been said about MH17 that um, that somehow the United States have anything to do with the most ridiculous thing. It's, it's ridiculous, but you know, you, you know, the Dutch government has come out with the, with these facts, and just it's crazy. So, yeah. Well, I was just going to sort of amplify what what Shannon said. Facts exist out there, and I think narrative is the way that you put them together to make a story. So before I came into doing this, I was a historian, right? And so if you have a bunch of historians arguing about, say, what caused the First World War. They're not going to dispute the facts. I mean, the facts are there in the documents. What they're going to dispute is what the significance of those facts there is. There were these treaties and these counter-treaties, yeah. and right. there was a telegram, and mm -hmm. somebody got shot. Yeah, and people are going to emphasize different, different facts. Some of them may yep. be more important than others. They may be arranged in a different way. Not all of those narratives are false. Uh, sometimes you can have multiple narratives that are true. Um, but I think what you're seeing, in the, especially in the Russian media space, is a complete disregard for truth as a marker of whether a narrative is, is appropriate or not. It's, the, it's not, there are multiple versions of the truth, it's just that truth as a marker doesn't even matter anymore. Can, can, I, uh, can I ask you, John, about, okay, just to this point, are there, are there comparables to RT in the Chinese media, and, and A, and then B, given sort of this conversation we've been having, what, what does this say about, what is Al Jazeera re reached that level, and what, what would you say about an Al Jazeera type uh, yeah, channel? I mean, I, mean I think they're in the a family of channels that have a central uh, purpose controlled by people who have an authoritarian grip on, or, or choose, or, or hope mm -hmm. to, um, and that benefit from creating a narrative, subtle sometimes and not as direct, but still are, it, it's, primary purpose is to keep and gain, gain control and keep control. Yeah, I, keep, I seem to remember Assam Bin Laden's favorite TV channel was Al Jazeera, which, yeah. which, which just definitely meant that I wasn't going to watch it then. Yeah. Right. The, the, but the, the um, is, are there exa what is the equivalent of RT in China? Is there one? CCTV would, yeah. would, would come to mind. Uh, I say RT is... Uh, perhaps more successful at being more subtle at times. Uh, it's more sophisticated, perhaps, I don't know. Yeah. But, uh, you know, it just goes to, it just goes to, you know, if you just back it all out, it just goes to controlling a narrative that keeps an, a regime in authority. Okay, so I'm just, I wanna see if there are any other questions or comments. Okay, this gentleman here hasn't had a chance to, to speak, I'm gonna, that's I'm Michael Korf, a uh, retired Foreign Service officer. I was just interested in your discussion about the uh, way you're going to go about countering uh, disinformation. It seems to me that in addition to rebroadcasting something or broadcasting using the same mechanism that uh, the uh, original disinformation came in, that you ought to be calling upon your colleagues who do public diplomacy at embassies to also get that message out that uh, there needs to be a, a great deal of uh, cooperation between mm -hmm. the BBG, for example, and the embassies mm -hmm. in order to make sure that all the channels are used. I, I think this is a very good point and a good question, which is, okay, so when I, we started, we organized this event, I said, well, well how's this play into public diplomacy? And it was very made clear, like, no, 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 you, you can't. So, so I think, so can you talk about what is your relationship with the State Department? 
What's your relationship with the your with folks who do who do public diplomacy, and what's your what's your joke? I think, and then and then to to the gentleman's point about well, what should or how should you or your colleagues be interacting with with U.S. embassies? I think is a good question, but I think it's in the context of this larger sure. discussion. Yeah. So let me start by talking about the firewall, and then I'll yes. move in that direction. So within the enshrined in the legislation that created the Voice of America and the BBG later is this notion that a firewall shall exist between the U.S. government and the editorial independence of the U.S. international media. Um, so the firewall suggests that nobody from the White House or the State Department or Capitol Hill can pick up the phone and call the head of our networks or call me and say, this is what this we want. This headline's got to read this here's way. What, here's what's going to happen. Uh, that's an important distinction. Uh, while people around the world, I'm sure, uh, have their own beliefs as to how the U.S. government is influencing uh, media. I'm here to tell you that it doesn't happen. And in fact, in the year that I've been here, it's never even come up. In fact, my experience is that people know about the firewall and stay as far away from it as they can. So, so let me just repeat that. So you've never gotten a phone call from a, a chairman of, a, of a, a chair of a congressional committee or the Secretary of State has not called you ever and said, I want you to change this. The National Security Advisor has called you and said, I want you to change this. Is that correct? That's correct. So I think we want to be very clear with, our, with our international audience that, that is, that's the way it operates here. It, it's, it's the way it, it, it would be illegal. It would be illegal. That, for that it'd be, it, So if someone called you and did that, it would be completely illegal it, for them. It would be. Okay. So it doesn't happen. So that's important for you to know and for any, anybody to know that, that the, 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 the agency of the BBG is an independent agency and the editorial decision making of our five networks is independent of any U.S. government pressure or involvement. Now that said, to your question, um, we are taxpayer supported um, and our role as a taxpayer supported agency is to do professional objective journalism around the world, professional and objective journalism around the world to foreign audiences. In order to do, do that well, it's a good thing for us to understand the priorities of U.S. foreign policy where that makes sense for us to invest our resources. And so as a, with that in mind, we have created an office, the Office of Policy and Research this year, and Jeff Trimble leads it, that allows us to be in conversations, interagency conversations, whether it's with you know, the State Department or whomever, so that we can hear and be aware of uh, issues around the world so that we're smart about the way we make our independent decisions. Yeah. Uh, and so it's the, the independence allows us in a, sort of a, uh, in, a, in a sort of an ironic twist, our independence and our firewall allows us to, to be a, you know, uh, in contact and connected because ultimately we decide what we do, but we do it from a position of knowledge and, and uh, involvement in conversations. So I want to amplify this point and also get to what is the connection at the country level. So again, going back to that example of CAR, you know, What's CAR? Central African Republic. So at the White House, we're seeing sort of this march into war and chaos, and we're thinking, you know, what capabilities do we have to try to influence people to get messages out um, to promote, you know, peace and reconciliation and tolerance. And so we did interagency phone calls, and the BBG would participate in those calls, would listen, and would come back and say, you know, this is what we're going to do with our assets in that area. Again, not directed. So Nobody you didn't tell them picking, on the phone saying, no, I want you to do this or that? No, but we're saying this is a big challenge. People are going to die. Everybody's really concerned about this. Like, what do we have amongst our different departments and agencies? Um, and you know, what does BBG, what does everybody have to bring to the table? And how can we align these pieces um, to try to influence the situation? So they independently came and said, this is what we think makes sense and this is what we can do. Similar conversations around countering ISIS propaganda or countering Russian disinformation. Again, part of the conversation um, and they could listen and understand what the priorities were, you know, coming out of the administration, but not in a way that was directed. Great. That's great. Thank you. Um, okay. This gentleman here. And this woman here. Hi. Thanks. Uh, my name is uh, Jack Kropensky. I'm unaffiliated. Um, the question is about RT. One of the, my impression of RT is that they're really trying to make the U.S. look bad 
trying to feed back news, whatever, saying how, how uh, either corrupt we are or how incompetent we are or something like that. So the question is, given the way the U.S. media is focusing on all the negative news, um, and, you know, there's a, there are polls that say that the uh, American people are unhappy with the direction of the country or unhappy with policy in Syria or wherever, you know, how can you take all that and put a, a positive spin on it? How does, how does, what's the philosophy that current time is going to use in that area? Sure. Okay, and then this, this woman here. Hello, Cynthia Eford with the Association for Public Diplomacy Professionals, PDAA, um, speaking for myself. Uh, you talked, you started out with a comment from uh, Royce from Congress uh, about how Russia was eating our lunch or something. Clearly the, pur the purpose of, of that comment was to force you or to push you in the direction of more, op more work on Russia, uh, but also more targeted, you know, harder edged. To what extent are you going to be able to resist uh, congressional efforts to make you be uh, counterproductive as you've described it? Uh, and also, in the concern to be flexible and surge, yes, you can bring in a flyaway uh, transmitter, but if you have shut down, as there was a danger at one point, a Ukrainian-speaking professional broadcasting service, uh, it do, you won't have anything to broadcast. So to what extent is there a danger that Congress will force you to chase the most recent target uh, rather than maintaining that's the uh, stable pl platform so, that's you know, necessary. What, how, what, whether it's, it could be the Congress or it could be the executive branch saying, well, I want you to go chase this or that, right? So, yeah. Yeah, no, it's, it's, a, it's a fair question. I, I haven't had a conversation that involved targeting resources that wasn't already self-evident to us in terms of our own independent judgment. Um, I quoted uh, Chairman Royce not about eating our lunch. At the I court. did. You did. The, the quote I had about him was weaponization of information. Um, but, and this kind of goes to the answer to your question too, John, and that is um, the, the messiness of, particularly these days, of politics in the United States and the message that sends. I think one way to look at that message is that it's negative and it feeds the, the beast of negativity about the U.S. I sort of look at it differently. I think the fact that you can have that messiness be for all to see is really an example of what a civil society actually looks like, that democracies can be messy. And I think you'd be hard pressed to find that kind of coverage within Russia about the Russian government, for example. And, and if I'm an objective person looking at those two things, my takeaway is everybody gets to talk in that country and here I only hear from the central government. So it's messy, but I think it's a demonstration of what a democracy actually looks like. And I think it's looked like that all along. I think it looked like that in the 18th century, too. Maybe even worse, from what I've read. Um, so, so there's that. And, and to your point, you know, the, we don't need a lot of help figuring out, I think, where we need to put our resources. And we don't get pushed to do it. We, we, we get comments about the other guys and how well they're doing. And then there's an urge to uh, reform the agency. And so to reform the agency, maybe we should split it up and maybe we should have two boards and maybe we should have this and that. And it just, for my way of thinking, the, the best way to reform BBG, which I believe we need to do, is to, is to continue the cooperation, strategic collaboration of the five entities, invest more in impact, measuring, holding ourselves accountable to impact, um, and ultimately holding uh, you know, holding forth that our credibility can be outlined through the measurements of impact as a means of uh, helping people understand that we're moving in the right direction. Okay. Good. Um, do you want to just, uh, I'm just cognizant of the time and I know uh, we've got, we've covered a, lot of, covered a lot of ground. So let me just ask you one last question, which is, um, so I'm going to be going home for Thanksgiving. I'm sure I'm going to see a number of family members going to say, why, why are we spending money on this stuff? So could you just close with, why, is, why do we need to continue to do this? Sure. So you can tell your mother the truth. Yeah. <laughs> the truth. I, face I didn't say it was my mother. I didn't say it was my mother. It may be my mother, but I'm not going to say it. I don't want to out her. So. Look, the United States is a safer place when 
civil society and democracy is growing and flourishing around the world. It's just that simple. And uh, recently, Freedom House reported that freedoms are declining in parts of the world for the fifth straight year. And I think as freedom declines around the world, the United States is more uh, likely than, than if freedom was growing to encounter problems. And so I think I would say to your mother or anybody at the Thanksgiving dinner table, this is one tool in the government's uh, toolbox, the tool of, of objective, independent, professional journalism that helps keep America safer overall because it promotes those values around the world. Great, thank you very much. I want to thank my colleagues.